So we're going to get started with the, the next uh, session, uh, which is a public, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a roundtable on public science. And this is actually uh, based on a program that LIGO Project has been running since last year called Science is Culture. And uh, the format is based on Lois's Weaver Long Table, which is a highly participatory, non-hierarchical discussion around a particular topic. Um, and as I already mentioned, ours today is, is public science. And so the format um, is a little bit different than what you might typically see at a, at a moderated panel. There are no specific questions, and the audience um, is encouraged to jump in and speak at any time. Ideally, when you speak, you have a microphone. <laughs> and so we'll be sort of running around with these microphones as best we can. Um, but just trying to remember, because we are recording, to please um, identify a microphone. Um, but we don't want to discourage that from you speaking. <laughs> um, so I just want to thank all of our seaters um, for the discussion today on public science for joining us. And I'm going to let each of them just introduce themselves and say a little bit about their connection to the topic. And so the only rule of engagement, other than, of course, being respectful to each other, is just to let all of the seaters get through their brief introductions before people start jumping in. OK. Vani, would you like to start? Um, so hello, everybody. Um, and thank you, Shane, for in inviting me to be part of this. Um, my name is Bhavani Venkatraman. Um, I'm an associate professor of chemistry here at Lang. Um, and I um, see many of our students here, so thank you so much for you guys for being here as well. So one of the things that the science department at Lang tries to do, which you may have heard about earlier today, is really try to connect the sa basic science to issues um, that engage students of social relevance. And so for me as a chemist, um, talking about teaching about a field which is beyond what you can see, touch, smell, um, the normal senses we learn through um, is challenging in some ways for students to see why is it they have to worry about um, what a molecule does or doesn't do. And so one of the things we, I try to aim to do is really connect the fundamental scientific chemical principles to issues around us. And the environment offers a particularly compelling and challenging lens through which to talk to, to investigate. And so my own work is in the field of chemical <coughs> education sort of investigating the, uh, um, the um, um, effectiveness of that approach in learning of science and chemistry. But I'm also deeply interested in about uh, communicating um, complex scientific issues to a larger audience. And the idea being there that if we can all understand better the science, can that help us become um, more informed about the critical decisions we need to make? And particularly, there's been a lot of reference, obviously, uh, earlier today about the political climate we currently reside in, and the challenges we're going to face in the environment, for example, and about deregulations, and understanding why they may or may not be good, and what are the pros and cons in these decisions, and how science informs it, but cannot be only scientific. It really has to encompass a lot of other um, societal um, aspects as well. So just in, that's really where I'm coming from in this discussion. <coughs> well, thank you for that. That's a hard act to follow. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. It's great to see um, such a <coughs> terrific mix of people who are interested in the art, science, technology nexus, and particularly for this panel on uh, the kind of social or public aspects of how uh, <coughs> art and science come together. Uh, my name is Patricia Olinick, and um, as you heard from Alan Levy's presentation, we are the co-directors of the New York Laser uh, Program, which we run out of Ellen's studio every six weeks. It's an arm of the Leonardo Group and the Leonardo Education and Art Forum Group. So if you're interested, come and see me later, and I'll get you on our mailing list. We convene every six weeks. Uh, I'm also an artist. <coughs> Maybe I should have said that first. I'm an artist. I also run the New York Lasers. And in addition, I am um, the director of the Graduate School of Art at Washington University, which is in St. Louis. So I spend my time going back and forth between the two cities. Um, and I am also a special advisor and perhaps future curator at the um, uh, St. Louis Science Museum. So we are very, um, uh, the, the Science Museum is becoming increasingly interested in educational programs for adults. Um, like many science museums, their children's programs are very well fleshed out, but they recognize that there's a, um, 
uh, a space for both discourse and practice for adults around topics, this, particularly the social aspects of science and, and also the, the, sci the hardcore science itself. So, uh, so I'm trying to um, assist them in developing programs and exhibitions uh, of, of artworks and art programs and conversations that will help to advance the more public side of science and um, probably that's a good place to stop. Thank you. Um, my name is Kate Walker and I don't have as organized or prepared <laughs> remarks. So um, I am more sort of in the applied side of uh, these issues. I work in um, film and video predominantly as a, I like to say, a multimedia journalist. Um, my kind of core areas of interest going back to my childhood have has been science and nature. Um, and instead of pursuing an advanced degree, uh, after getting an undergrad degree in biology, I, I realized that I really wanted to spend my time in my life communicating about um, these issues, both uh, from a sort of personal motivations for creativity and artistic expression, but also um, with kind of science literacy in mind and hoping to, to find a way to um, inspire people and um, have, have science sort of be part of people's thinking, how, what, how they approach the world sort of more, more holistically. So kind of going back to that Carl Sagan quote about science is not so much a body of knowledge, I'm totally paraphrase, paraphrasing here, uh, but a way of thinking. And um, through, so through a lot of video that has an educational aspect as well, um, I guess I, I consider my, my work and my goal and my work is to, to kind of create a, a larger scientific mindset without defining science as rigidly as it has been defined. Oh, I have a microphone already. Hi everybody, my name is Colin Wiles. I am a program manager at Cooper Genomics. We're a clinical genetic testing company. And so we really work in the field of reproductive genetics. Um, so it's a, an area that overlaps with biotechnology, uh, clinical practice, and a lot of public uh, engagement because this is, you know, genetics is an issue where we have ethical concerns, uh, concerns around like patient information, and this is also a field where the act of even giving information raises a lot of questions for patients and you know policymakers uh, alike. So we spend a lot of time educating uh, doctors and healthcare providers, uh, patients, and policymakers about a whole range of uh, different ethical and uh, technical limitations around the type of information that we can provide and it's something that's becoming you know increasingly important as the power of uh, genetic testing continues to uh, improve and evolve and it's something that I've always been interested in kind of on the border between uh, clinical practice and you know patient experience provider experience with all access to this information so that's where I'm coming from Hi, I'm Liz Slagas, and I am the Director of Public Programs and Residencies for the New York Hall of Science, which is in Queens. Um, my department actually sits within external affairs, so my partners at the museum are really um, PR and marketing, which is a little bit different than other public programs at other museums. Um, and my, my job is really, and our, my department's job is really to bring in and create a, uh, different contexts, events, workshops, conferences, um, sometimes contexts for artists and scientists to work together to draw in uh, new and different audiences, um, one of which is an older audience, um, because as Patricia mentioned earlier, um, I think a problem for many <coughs> uh, science centers in the US is that um, it really, the age sort of caps off at 12, um, people coming out to the museum. Um, and there's, there's a lot of great things to do and have people do and conversations to be had um, in the museum, in the science museum context. The other hat that I wear that also makes sense of me being here is that I am um, one half of a collaboration called Sex Ed, um, which is um, an art project that I run with my collaborator Noreen Letty. Um, and we use um, art as a way to um, foster dialogue about sexual health topics with different uh, communities. And we document that work as resources that can be shared for free. Um, and also as curriculum that doesn't exist in the US for sex ed. 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So we can open the floor to uh, participatory discussion now, and I'm just going to throw out the first thought or question, um, which the seeders can address, or anybody in the audience, feel free to jump in. Is I'm curious, um, sort of everyone's thinking around sort of public science and science outreach and the, the work and the things that a lot of us in this room are doing. And given sort of the political climate and everything happening right now, is it best to sort of stay our course? Or should we be sort of, is it a time that we should also be really rethinking and reevaluating what we're doing and how we're doing it? Um, because this is something I, I wonder a lot myself. Yeah, um, well, <laughs> I can Wikipedia it for you now. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, we should have the definition up there. So um, I actually, I have one. okay, perfect. Which basically, I, I mean, actually, I'm gonna have you guys share this one, Mike, yes. so if you can pass it around. Thank you. Sure, I mean, basically, you know, something that I, I coalesced from a lot of different definitions doing a Google search on this is, it's the collection and analysis of data relating to the natural world by members of the general public typically as part of a collaborative project with professional scientists. Is that, is, sure, sure. <clears throat> no problem. Uh, the collection and analysis of data relating to the natural world by members of the general public, typically as part of a collaborative project with professional scientists. Is it specifically, you know, I'm just going to call not experts collaborating with, you know, experts, or is it just the? Could it also be experts that happen to share their 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 data, their, their results with the public, as opposed to you know a private company, you know, withholding their their results, or uh, all of the above? Or there, are, there are several international okay. organizations that will that have downloaded. Um, S structures for collecting the data, analyzing it, and uh, explaining how it is that the um, citizens' observations and collections of data are actually tying into those projects. So it would be different if you're collecting data on uh, the Arctic and the history of weather in the Arctic than it would be if you were collecting data on astronomy. So. All of these kinds of groups will organize citizens around a particular set of issues or questions, tell the citizens what they, how they can help and what they need to do, um, and, uh, uh, and then tell them how that data will be factored into uh, a broader kind of meta-analysis of okay. a problem. Yeah, that, that, that helps a lot. So it's a lot of, uh, in, it's engagement specifically with the general public, right? And obviously you need some domain expertise in there. Okay, yeah. I think I get it. And, and I think that expertise can be relayed in a very active way, but also a somewhat passive way, like opening up data as a source for citizen science, but maybe not working directly with that particular scientist or expert, but the data is out there for the public to use. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so to what end? I mean, is, is, is the benefit just to engage the general public, or is the benefit that, no, we're gonna, we're, you know, incorporating these different skill, skill sets, we're gonna solve the problem better. Maybe I should wait, because that's also gonna suggest a different way of looking at this. Okay. So I don't wanna change this frame of that. Cool. I was, do you wanna jump in right oh, there? Yeah, I am. the mic. Oh, yes, sorry. No, not a problem. Hi, I think sometimes, well, it, again, it depends, but there are projects even that uh, will try to attain like actual scientific insights from public participation in science. And the, for example, the one that comes to mind is a, a website called Fold It. I'm not sure if people have heard of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be one example. And then there are also patient advocacy groups, for example, uh, you know, in the field of, you know, communities who are affected with a particular genetic disease will often self-organize and uh, recruit, like either recruit participants for research studies or, um, you know, as play some role in, in gathering data. So I think even beyond public engagement as a, a you know a, a facade of goodwill, almost there is like there is a reason uh, for scientists to be 
interested in uh, either the power of like crowdsourcing some type of insight on occasion or getting uh, feedback on you know particular facet of their research as it pertains to a community. Sometimes you know there will be issues of ethics that you know is this research affecting a um, a community in a particular way, and if so, do we have like their consent and their their um, you know their goodwill? So and yeah, there are there are broader there are broader issues. Oh, go ahead. Do you want? I was just. Sorry. Oh, just not to overcomplicate it, but I think there's also, uh, they're the vectors of public engagement towards science learning purely for science learning's sake, right? So there's, you know, the vector of receiving back from the public information, data, citizen participation in projects, um, but there's also this broader question of learning and to what extent does engagement with the public promote science learning as an end unto itself? Um, I was actually going to switch it, flip it around a bit because I think, um, it seems to be more coming outward from the scientific community to the public and not, um, and so just think of it the other way around. So an example of that, which is a really unfortunate, tragic example of what happened in Flint, Michigan, mm -hmm. where um, it was sort of the reverse because the uh, community was clearly dealing with a catastrophe that the government, local governments were not willing to pay full attention to. And then the residents themselves reaching out to a scientist and a pediatrician to actually help them figure out what was going on. So also to suggest that we need to, going back to your point of rethinking that, is that getting that real, real collaborative engagement on both sides, so it's not just the scientific community coming out to the public and say, saying, not that, there's, not that there's not value in that, but also how the community can also help define the kinds of questions that we as scientists should also be working on. So I'd like to also open that part of the conversation. Well, and that's why, to go back to, to go back to Shane's question of whether we should stay the course or we need to radically rethink things, um, I would I would vote stay the course. <laughs> um, maybe that'll provoke discussion, but um, because I I do I do think some some of these uh, modes of outreach are having an effect. One of my favorite examples is um, people's fascination, of course, with. Think sites like 23andMe and Ancestry.com and getting your, your DNA. And I sometimes ask myself, I wonder how many of those people who get their DNA believe in evolution and um, or really even understand, you know, you know what, what is this information they're, they're getting. But I think there are ways where, you know, science is kind of, entering the mainstream in, in different kind of watered down ways. Um, but I think it's a start. And I think um, citizen science and, and sort of some of these ways of engaging people are having a positive effect. So it doesn't mean there shouldn't be more, but um, I, think, I think people are interested and people are smarter than we sometimes like to give them credit for. So that's all. Um, I just want to throw out here, uh, there's like a sociology idea called participatory action research, or PAR. And it's been around for a while. And I think I'm bringing it up because we're always thinking about science, art, and citizenry uh, as it's like different or oppositional, but we're all community members. And I just want to read you the definition according to Wikipedia because I think it's a nice generalist term and we don't have to be science, art, di you know, have a dichotomy. So participatory action research, or PAR, is an approach to research in communities that emphasizes participation and action. It seeks to understand the world by trying to change it collaboratively and following reflection. PAR emphasizes collective inquiry and experimentation grounded in experience and social history. Within a PAR process, communities of inquiry and action evolve and address questions and issues that are significant for those who participate as co-researchers. PAR contrasts with many research methods which emphasize disinterested researches, researchers and reproducibility of findings. PAR practitioners make a concern a concerted effort to integrate three basic aspects of their work, participation, life in society and democracy, action, engagement with experience and history, and research, 
soundness in thought, and the growth of knowledge. Action unites organically with research and collective processes of self-investigation, the way each component is actually understood and the relative emphasis it receives varies nonetheless from one PAR theory and practice to another. This means that PAR is not a monolithic body of ideas and methods, but rather a pluralistic orientation to knowledge making and social change. You know, I'm a little bit confused because I wasn't the impression that we're trying to marry science and art so that we can make a difference in society. I mean, I mean that's what I, that's what I envision. And one of the things that, that really bothers me is, you know, we're all involved right now in politics, Mr. Trump and so on and so forth. One of the things that we don't look at is what's happening to us right now, especially in the city. And I am referring specifically to nursing homes. Uh, we're, I'm old, but we're <laughs> all going to get old. And yet, we as a society worship youth. And therefore, nursing homes to us, or getting old to us, is kind of you, you're already ready to die, so you no longer have any dignity, you don't longer have any desires, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I wonder how the five of you can perhaps help me engage society a little bit more deeper into, you know what? That could be your mother, your father, your uncle, et cetera. But beyond that, it could be you. Shouldn't you be thinking about dignity about those people today so that when you get old, you get that dignity? So how would you frame that as a question? <laughs> how do we engage society mm -hmm. who ignores yeah. Well, that sounds like a great citizen science project. Has anybody f uh, accessed any of these sites and found a community of citizen science people working with this subject? You should be the one. It's a great question. I mean, it's a, it's a terrific question. And, um, you know, the, the, the one word that stuck out um, from the, the woman along the edge, sorry, I don't know your name, that uh, was talking about plurality. I mean, this is one possibility for citizen science is to kind of radically expand uh, critical conversations across diverse communities, but also to bring to the attention of those communities critical issues that are driving contemporary culture that are pressing for all of us. So. Um, you know, maybe the best thing to do is to look at some of these. There is just there are just these international consortiums of organizations bringing people interested in citizen science, bringing them together online. And I mean, you could do one of two things. You could probably propose a project, or maybe hop on board one that is already aligned with that interest. That's what I would suggest. I don't know if anybody else has a. I mean, it's public science, citizen science, I mean, it's a model for engaging people. And um, because I think to, to your point of how, I mean, people need, a, I think need, people need something to wrap, a project to wrap their head around, um, a, a way into empathy, um, or they're not gonna join. Um, because, you know, we're not all on every citizen science project that exists. We're on the ones that mean something to us intrinsically, and so, you know, it's it's the the devil is in the details of, of how you put that question out there. What specifically the project is to get at the heart of what you're trying to achieve, um, and you know, and you are you are pointing to the fact that we'll all be old, but will that be enough um, to pull people in? Um, so it's uh, I don't have a particular frame for you, but that is that's that's the hook that you need to work on um, because that's how. That's how you lure people into projects. It's, it's making them feel as if, um, yes, they'll be part of this research, but they'll be part of this research for a really important reason, which is them or someone close to them. 
Um, you know, it's uh, the projects that have gone viral, I think have gone viral for reasons, you know, I, I'm, and the worst one that I'm just thinking of, which was not a citizen science project at all, but I'm just thinking of, you know, because um, I'm thinking of like the ALS, um, uh, you know, bucket thing. <laughs> but, it was, but it was because people were um, compelled to feel something. They had someone in their life. Um, it was an issue that wasn't getting enough attention. Um, it's not unlike what you're talking about. Um, you know, yes, we're all getting old. We don't like to talk about that. We don't like to face that. Um, so not answering your question, but <laughs> I'm seconding that it needs to, to go out there. Yeah. But I do think within institutions, sorry. Uh, this is just one quick comment. I do think within institutions, especially universities, um, you know, I talk to a lot of my colleagues across the country, uh, public health, aging, I mean, these are increasingly becoming really important topics within academic institutions. So I think uh, people within the academy are keenly aware of the fact that we have larger populations of aging people and that this is going to be a problem moving forward. So it does feel to me like a, a very central and very critical conversation that I hear happening, at least on my campus. So. I just, I just want to expand upon that. See, I've been involved in this for the past 20 years, and, and I have gone to all the conferences at, at, at the New York, uh, you know, um, the medical, whatever, up on 130th Street. And yes, they are involved, but, but they're involved from an academic point of view, and, and that's the reason I asked the question because everybody's involved in, in, in something academic, but they're not looking at the problem which is occurring right now. There was a report last week that, that um, there is, uh, women are being sexually assaulted in nursing homes, and, and all of a sudden everybody gets very involved and they're gonna investigate the government. Well, there are systems that the government set up. There's a lot of money being spent in regulating the nursing homes. However, because the public is not involved, mm -hmm. then there's apathy, and as you said, it's only when the shoe doesn't fit you that you become involved because there's mm -hmm. pain involved. Actually, there's yeah. a pain yeah. issue. Yeah. But before there's pain, there's total apathy. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, I hate to say this, but. Look what has happened to our military. When I served, I used to walk around and people would tap me on the shoulder and say, can I buy you a drink? Can I take you home for dinner? That was the general approach to the military. Today, we have less than 1% of the population involved with the military. Net, net, what's the outcome? What, what's the reality? About between 40 and 50 percent of our 60,000 homeless in New York City are ex servicemen. None of us is interested. Nobody talks about it. And again, it's right in front of us, and we see, I mean, I, at least I see it walking my street, people laying on the street, the homeless. Many of them were ex servicemen. So here, they put their lives on the line for the country. And they come back to the country, and the country just ignores them. I, I would like to respond to that. Um, what, oh, I'm so sorry, Kat, please. No, 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 I was going to give someone the mic, but you sure. already have one. What's your name? Sorry. Gilbert. Gilbert, hi, Elena. Um, to address what you're saying, and I feel also to address the question that you posed, Shane, um, and this is something that I think about a lot in my own academic pursuits of science, which are pretty much the only ones I have so far, um, is that when we think of, and when we use the definition of public health that you read out, there were these four spheres. There was data, the natural world, public, and professional scientists. And when you think about engaging or incorporating the public into the, the sphere of science, as we who study it or work in it like to think of it as, it, it requires leadership. And I think leadership is something that 
is almost synonymous to what we've been talking about prior to this round table, the marrying of both art and science, because it lends to creative thought, it lends to the, all the tools that we laid out in those PowerPoints of ways of thinking constructively and, and uh, marrying these two ideas to get something bigger across to solve these problems. But the, that marrying of different concepts is an integral part of being a leader and having leadership qualities. Those are the qualities of being a leader. So when we think about science as being this thing that you said should remain, should remain in its course, should always be the hard analysis and understanding of data, let, letting facts speak for themselves so they're not manipulated for purposes that are unjust or inequitable. The problem with that is that scientists suddenly do not remain leaders. They become subjects to their work. They become enslaved to the data that they can interpret for themselves but can't lend the broader perspective to everyone else because that's not what you're supposed to do. Science isn't about telling people what you think based off of these things. You let the data speak for itself. So I think the problem that you're encountering and that I encounter too is that, and I, and I find this massive, a, a massive problem is that there is very, there are very few people who consider themselves scientists who, who stand for something in that sense too. I mean, we all interpret our own data and feel as though we are people with means, needs to express ourselves, which is why we create art, philosophy, religion, etc. But if we were to marry those two concepts, we'd have good leaders, good scientific leaders who would actually propagate the things that you're talking about. We would have people who, who care about the older populations, not just not just saying, oh, please join this community or enter this or look online for people that you can join. It would be, um, it would be a, a general sense of leadership that would help in terms of public education and help in terms of guiding the public into entering the world of science that seems so locked up in an ivory tower. We don't need more scientists. We don't need all these things. We need leaders in every walk of life. And that's how you solve that problem is by making people recognize that the marrying of different fields makes a leader, not a good scientist. And the more leaders we have, the more people will be willing to, to give up their time for people that aren't them, to develop empathy, to develop all these creative thinking tools that we use. And I feel like that's the future. I don't think we should remain in the course. I think that we always need to be reinventing, rethinking how we do everything. That's the point of science in my perspective. Okay, I'll jump in real quick with a question. Uh, Gilbert, I think I also want to just respond by saying uh, that what you're bringing to, the, to light here is exactly the way we need to get this conversation out into the world. So although I don't have anything specifically to respond to what you brought up, I think the fact that you're talking about something that's on the streets right now is important for this today, and we should keep that in mind. But I want to ask, I want to ask a question maybe to the panel or in general, uh, getting back to Shane's prompt about staying the course. I have, a, I have a sense from some of what was said, uh, again, Kate, what you were talking about, um, and, I, and this is also for Colin a little bit, of, of we're, we're talking about science uh, as sort of a monolithic force for good. Just the more science that gets out into the world, the better. And I just want to poke at that a little bit. I think this, is, I, this speaks to a bit what you're bringing up too, which is leadership speaks to more of context with ethical implications, with moral implications. And so I just want to ask, you know, when, when, when I heard you t say, for example, we're talking about 23andMe and more, and, and we're talking about genetics, I, I could have also imagine a world where the more awareness of genetics <coughs> in the current schisms of class differences leads parents to realize that they can, you know, get in there earlier on with their kids if they have the financial resources to start treating their kids in some different way than others could. So I'm just wondering, is, there, is it really the, the, the case that more of this getting out into the world is good? Can we, can we reframe this a little bit larger to say, maybe we do need to stay the course, the course in some regards, but there's more context we need in others? Oh, I'm sorry, actually, Daniel had a comment no, as well. If you want to respond, I have a comment for our previous slide. Sorry. Um, just a moment, let me remember everything then. <laughs> So I think these issues are not unrelated uh, when we're talking about leadership, uh, the need for you know, decisive action and also like the decisive interpretation of data. Um, and not just like, in, yeah, 
for the space of genetics, it's particularly important that we're not just looking at information or like data, but we're looking at meaningful information and that we're asking ourselves the right questions and that our questions are informed uh, by good intent, not only good intent, but like consent and uh, and consent, I mean, in the broader term, where not only you know do we have a superficial understanding of what we're agreeing to, but that the communities or the patients that you're talking to understand the implications of the research or the knowledge that's being given to them. For example, uh, just to make that a little bit clearer, uh, a lot of times people will learn about you know I want to see if I'm a carrier for a particular disease, or I want to see um, yeah if my child would be at risk to have a particular disease. And suddenly uh, they find out that with their partner, you know, their child is at risk to, um, you know, be deaf. There's a 25% chance that that child would be at risk to be deaf. And now they have this choice uh, where they can either undergo an expensive procedure uh, to diagnose an embryo, an IVF, to, you know, say like, hey, like these embryos would grow up to be a child uh, who would, you know, develop early onset deafness or we could, um, you know, select this embryo, which would be a perfectly healthy child, perhaps. And they're confronted now because they have this information. Do we take advantage of this test, or do we risk it? And you know, say like we have a 75% chance that you know our child will not be deaf and that we won't have that you know certain amount of suffering. So there are questions that patients don't understand before they ask for this information. And that really gets to the issue of like informed consent. There has to be an understanding that like not only are we investigating the right questions, but like we want to know the answers, and that we have you know like that this this knowledge is going to be useful for us in some way, and that we're going to be able to make like a meaningful impact with it. Uh, so that practice I think needs to be applied more broadly across the field of science, uh, because really we're looking from sci science as a way of you know questioning assumptions and gathering useful information from empirical data. Uh, and really the heart of that is asking the right questions, not just interpreting or you know, getting the, the data from whatever sources you want. So you know, to get back to you, the questions that we ask need to be informed by the populations uh, and the people and the individuals who you know, need help or need, uh, or subjects that need revisiting. And that is a job for scientists uh, when they engage with the public, and that's a job for scientists when they engage with policymakers. But it's also a job for citizens who have a you know a baseline understanding of these issues to you know at least bring them up or discuss them. It's really a, a shared responsibility because science, for all of its greatness, is very limited in you know the 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 results it can achieve. You know, scientists who are also leaders may be able to do more, but we're living in a collective society now where we need to share uh, some of that work. I want to respond to that a little bit. Um, a couple things. Um, when it comes to leaders and identifying um, important but probably really um, ingrained problems such as um, kind of our, our not paying attention to um, elder members of our population, um, I do think that leadership n really needs to come from the ground up, and I think it really needs to resonate with uh, where the populace I is and what the populace is feeling. I think Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump both speak to that. Um, and Trump is also an example of, you know, the, the populace is not necessarily fully informed um, in making their decisions, but that it, it still can be that, you know, leadership does happen, <laughs> or positions of leadership happen um, based on the, the power of the populace. And so I don't think that that's necessarily controllable. I also don't think that, um, you know, if we think about this, this situation of um, a couple having a, a choice over, um, you know, armed, armed perhaps with more information about the genetic makeup of their child, you know, whether they would pursue that pregnancy or not. Um, unfortunately, I don't think the business world is necessarily going to let us wait to make those decisions in sort of the most informed way that we would want to. Um, I don't think that they would necessarily, uh, like, kind of let us control that information getting out there. I think that, you know, probiotics are a perfectly good example of that. There's, you know, the microbiome is still a very kind of new area of research and I think has tremendous potential, but, um, you know, supplement companies have already 
jumped on the bandwagon of probiotics, most of which are complete junk. Um, and yet they're making lots of money off of it and fortunately not in any harmful way, but um, we don't have a lot of control over how scientific information gets used. And so as a result, I think it's, <laughs> um, we, we don't, we can't control that conversation. We, we can only, I think, do our best to give people as much information as we can, so. Um, hi, my name is Daniel. Uh, I just, I missed the beginning of the, the discussion, so I may be going over stuff you already talked about, but I just, in response to Gilbert's point about not being able to see what's in front of our faces and then the follow-up about leadership, it sort of brings to mind a few things. One was um, what Ellen said about attention and the difficulty in our culture to have spaces where we pay attention. So that would be one thing. The other thing is that as scientists or as artists or as uh, Americans, we're, we're actually part of the problem. And so uh, I don't want to over-determine that, but we're, we're, when I moved to the States, I was very aware that I was coming to the center of the empire and that um, I was going to be at the top of a pyramid that was dependent on world domination and extraction of natural resources, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. right? So um, whether we're in the academy in whatever ivory tower we happen to be in, or even on the side of the tower. I'm an artist and I'm not part of the academy, but I'm definitely part of the center of power and, you know, I live in New York. Um, but so there's kind of a paradox, I think, for those of us who are interested in uh, defending science and in, in giving people the tools of science to kind of m bring those things together. Uh, and the third thing I'd like to suggest is that um, we're, I think we might all agree that we're in a new paradigmatic space, right? Where a lot of the rules and ways in which we made meaning before are being reevaluated. And we make meaning by telling stories, right? Whether it's stories in numbers, you know, stories in uh, experiments, stories in stories. <laughs> um, and those stories can come from a lot of different places. They can come from the academy, they can come from the arts, but they also come from, for lack of a better word, the street, or uh, they come from all sorts of places. And I think one of the roles, one of the things citizen science offers, or this new framework offers, is that we, don't, we are faced with probably insurmountable problems, and we now know that we don't know where the solutions will come from, right? And most likely they're gonna come from some place that's unexpected or some connections that, were hap that happened between unexpected points. And probably none of us in the room are gonna be on those points. They're actually gonna be um, new. Um, and so I think one of the questions we face is how do we as actors I would think maybe not leaders, as non-leaders, is how do we facilitate a space or support a space in which those kinds of voices that often don't have the opportunity to, to speak or to pose. Um, you know, I'm very sympathetic with Gilbert's question because I'm 52 and my parents are 84 and 85 and we're really facing those right now. Um, when I turned 40, my eyesight started going. You know, I, nobody had told me that it's normal and that I would have to have glasses and stuff and I'm a painter so I was really freaked out. But there are all of these invisible, these things that you fall into and you start to see and there are a lot of those spaces in our lives, right? And they're very socio-culturally determined and they depend on access to power and I mean if you come to New York, you, you walking through neighborhoods is like a schizophrenic experience, right? You go from whatever, you've all been there. Um, <laughs> in both directions. Um, so I, I just kind of just want to throw those sort of key points as part of the discussion. I think there's, um, we're facing a, a contradiction which is very deep and which is about um, how are you present as an actor 
and attentive to the fact that the power that you, you hold is actually to share it, to, to be part of a collective. And that's the, that's the uh, potential that we see, and that's also the, what the failure we, we face, is the inability to do that. I think there's really a profound moment that we're trying to grapple with. So sorry, it doesn't take the form of a question, it's just a, whatever that was. Um, I do have a question, which maybe draws a little on what you're saying. Um, one of my biggest concerns with interdisciplinarity and with liberal arts and sciences and all of these kind of mingling spaces is that that too becomes a silo. So you have like the art scientists over there. And especially because most of the time you encounter interdisciplinary courses in university, which is a long way into your education. Um, and I, so when I read about projects like in Finland that the state education has now become around subject rather than discipline, I get really excited. I'm really curious what that's going to look like. And that also, I can imagine, would provide a background where indeed citizens can engage. Because before they even can, you have to know something about science, so that it's not a scary word or art. And um, so I'm wondering what you guys think about that, about organizing from a much earlier level education around subject rather than discipline. And also whether you think there's anything negative around that. because. I mean, people are terrified about reorganizing state education. That's a big step. That's a headline. And Finland isn't often in the headlines. So apparently, it's a big deal. Um, so yeah, I'm curious what people think about that. Um, I wanted to kind of like, and I guess I'm already standing. It'd be weird to sit down. Um, <laughs> my name's JB. I am an artist raised by scientists. Um, and I kind of wanted to like, like step outside of this moment for, I mean, I guess not outside, but to step aside and like attend to the word information for a second. And I guess in like the consideration of that, um, hearing now and in a contemporary world of like a lot of folks talking about um, a shifting of truth systems that you tell yourself about who you are in the world that you live in. And I actually wanted to assert that you know, for a lot of people, like, this isn't a new political climate. These aren't new forms of oppression. And there have been people that have been experiencing them for a long time. So this is really just kind of um, an imagining of a place where, like, more people that have, I don't know, a certain sense of, like, digital presence or what have you or resources are capable of saying that they don't accept certain things and that people actually listen. And then um, I wanted to say, like, in terms of like how we assign authority, um, I've like said this, I've told this anecdote like a bunch in the last like five days, but anyway, so I had um, a professor that I knew that was a historian of science and he said two things that I took away and have not yet been false. And the two things were, one, that your question curates your data. So that means that like, that type of rhetoric, when you look at something, there's no such thing as like useless information, but also like that type of discernment, like the type of attention that, which was kind of my earlier question of like, while manipulation may be a nasty word, if you look at the root system of it, it means to like handle. Um, so, and information is that way too, is like the brain being formed by certain types of a thing that you see and you look at that may or may not be true or false. And there was something that David Foster Wallace gave in his, um, it was like a commencement speech and he's talking about a fish being in water. And he's like, I'm a fish in water and you have to remind yourself that there actually isn't a capacity for ourselves to be empathetic in the way that we talk about it, which is also to say that like, do not assume that you know, um, that you can take on the burdens of like, a large group of folks, and to also like, be careful about the way that you advocate, which is not to say that like, I don't know, you should diminish the capacity for taking up a cause, right? But um, there was something, um, I'm, it's like a fragment of information, that I'm gonna do like a really bad job of relaying it, but there's a writer uh, called Dussel, and he talks a lot about um, uh, folks trying to come up with different codes and ways of deciding how to uh, build leadership in their community, and he calls it an organic intellectual. And so it's someone that 
by their very own experiences, like one of the few select people from, I don't know, like a community that can actually go and speak about something um, or be able to take up, I don't like the word cause, but I guess that word cause. But um, yeah, I thought I'd just kind of like insert that. So um, I'm gonna have Brian uh, make a comment and then we're gonna have to start <coughs> closing this well, the round table up and I'll have one of you, if you'd be so kind to sort of wrap us up after Brian comes. I think one of the issues is that science is a moving target and so what's appropriate today was not appropriate years ago and so we can learn something from history. Um, at least in the 20s and 30s, uh, science was a gentleman's uh, project. Uh, people at Harvard got money from uh, people who gave them money and they behaved as a single unified people studying science. Then along came World War II, and what you found is if you, if you spend $2 billion and put a 10,000 scientists in one place at one time, a lot of very powerful things come out, and what came out was the atom bomb and that whole period, and then the response to that has to be very different from what was happening with science before that. The next, I'm just going over very quickly history. Then comes the Vietnamese War, and then what was the role of scientists, and at that time, the scientists really went on a protest. MIT went on a one day of not doing science and what it's going to do instead of science is we're going to think about what are the implications of what I'm doing. The next, the next thing comes with the biotechnology revolution in the 80s and what was interesting there was that when the atom bomb was built, not a single person who was involved in building the atom bomb had a financial interest in what was going on. When the biology revolution took place, every single professor at MIT had a self-interest in what was going on. And their students were directed and their science was directed. So we're normal people. Uh, we have all the interests that other people have. Now we're probably in a stage where environment is the major concern. So I think we should relax a little bit and then be vigilant at the same time. One, we all can't be everything to everybody. We all can't be leaders. Some of us have to just do science and that's it because that's what it requires to do good science. What you're hoping is that there are a lot of what I'll call 5% solutions. Everyone is doing their share. Some people are advancing science, some people are dealing with the philosophy, some people are dealing with the history. I think the best thing that anyone can do if you want to know what to do is to teach non-science majors or non-art majors. And you get to feel what the world is really like and what are really of interest to those people. And it's a busy life for all of us. There's no way of solving all the problems. You've got to hope that collectively enough people know enough about things to do their share. So, yeah, I actually think that was a great way to <laughs> wrap up this roundtable. Thank you, Brian.